Hey, Alba fam. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to our intermediate TypeScript bootcamp. I'm pretty excited and I'm ready to keep learning. And also, I have always liked Python a lot. My goal this year is to learn TypeScript. And in this bootcamp, I can take a big step because not only I will learn how to add more functionalities to our smart contract, but also we will improve the user interface using TypeScript in Algorand. Today with me is Giorgio, DevRel at Algorand Foundation. Hi, Giorgio, how are you doing, my friend? Are you ready for the action? Yeah, of course, I am ready. I'm excited to, um, to watch the material and to learn something. <laughs> Wonderful. And Giorgio, what we can expect to learn during this bootcamp? Okay, so uh, during this bootcamp, we will be covering uh, improvements to the previous digital marketplace application. So uh, in the, I'm going to mention this in the video, but essentially we are going to improve the contract of the digital marketplace in the sense that there will be one application for the entire network and we will see how to handle multiple users on the same application. Uh, and the structure will be very much like the structure of the other boot camps, uh, both Python and TypeScript. So today we'll be taking a look at the contracts. Tomorrow we will be testing those new contracts. Third session is the front end changes. And the fourth session for a bit of a treat, we are going to um, improve both the contracts and the front end to allow for options. Awesome. So we are going to learn a lot of things and we can take advantage of the things and the features that Algorand offers us. Okay, so we are ready. I have some announcement. The first one, you will receive the recordings once the session ends. The second one, on session four, I will share the link and explain the process to claim the certificate of completion. And the last one, don't forget to join us on Discord. I will share the link on the chat. And if you have any question, you can use the question tab. And over there, we can answer all the things that you want to understand better. OK, Giorgio, we are ready. Thanks again. And let's go, Algo Fam. Yes, we will watch. Uh, we will start by watching the first video um, that has an introduction and a way to set up your project. So, yes, let's watch that. Hello, and welcome back to the first session of TypeScript Intermediate Bootcamp. In, so in this session, we're going to do some preparation work for us to start coding in the next recording. Um, and so let's first make sure that we have Docker running. I'm going to start it. And let's open our terminal. And uh, yeah, so this is my Docker, local Docker instance running. So I can close that now and I can focus on, uh, let me see if I can increase the, the font size a little bit. Yeah, there you go. So I want, first of all, to verify that I'm in version 2.0.6 so this version of algo kit will pull down specific versions of the templates so just make sure that you have the latest version possible um, at the time when you either are watching this live or if you're watching this recording um, you can do that if you install by via pip, pip x uh, upgrade algo kit. Now I should have it at the latest version already. Okay, so if you had an upgrade at this stage, what I recommend to do in order to start the local net is to do a algo kit local net reset and update. This with this command will just make sure that. Uh, any previous previously existing version of the local net is 
uh, deleted and a new one is started with the latest uh, container versions. Perfect, okay. Uh, it says that it started, just, just for your information, if you want, you can always check with alg uh, algokit local net status. And this should give you information about your, lo your local net. So, in, for instance, everything is divided by container. So, these are the algo, algo D information. The conduit information, the database, and indexer. Uh, so I okay with, with this out of the way let's uh, create the project let me increase the font size a little more so I want to be in this folder you may of course choose any other folder that you want to set up your project in and we start with algokit in it and this will be the command that you use anytime you want to start uh, a new project. So we want to choose smart contracts and um, a decentralized application front end. We could select uh, this, this, um, these options too. Uh, and then we would have to run AlgoKit in it. But since we know that we're going to be build both a contract and frontend. Let's just start from this template. Now I want to use TypeScript, of course. This is a language for the smart contracts. Uh, and I'd like to call this project TypeScript uh, Intermediate Digital Marketplace. OK. We want to use the production uh, template. Uh, we won't be using everything from the production template, but we will at least do some testing. And it's much easier have it set up from the production uh, template rather than the starter one, because in the starter one, we would have to do a lot of things by hand. And the production is just uh, comes with testing integration with Jest. So, this is what we want to select, and the name of our contract will be Digital Marketplace. Oh, hold on, let me let me just uh, pause the volume on my PC. So, Digital Marketplace. Let's start. Uh, we will skip the CD setup. This is used if you want to have a setup where new new versions of your front end are automatically deployed with GitHub integration to either Netlify or Vercel. We won't be doing that. OK, I'm going to pause right now because uh, this may take some time. OK, and we want to uh, run Algokit project bootstrap uh, because this will install dependencies for both the contracts um, project and the front end project. And this, again, may take a while for me, so I'm just going to pause the recording. Um, actually, while we wait for this to install, I thought it would be useful to give some people following the code live some time to catch up, because if it, this is taking some time on my machine, it may take some time on your machine too. So I think, oh, and now that I say that, it just unlocked itself. Um, anyway, let's... Uh, finish this and we'll still go through some introduction to the project. Um, so I'm going to say no to initializing a Git repository and performing a commit, but you should. And this is the end of the uh, initial wizard. So what I wanted to talk about briefly is the way that we are going to gather the information to write the new iteration of the contract. Uh, and one of these re resources will be the developer portal at developer.algorand.org. And let me try then to increase page size a little bit. And the other resource would be the TILScript uh, page 
for the documentation. You will find this at tlscript.netlify.app. You can click on Learn TLScript and it will guide you through the fundamentals of the language and also through a um, an initial example which comes with a template and it will be uh, already good to compile and play with. So I think from the developer portal we want to start and talk about what we, how we want to upgrade the digital marketplace. So uh, if we take a look at this page called contract storage this is a pretty important page and um, you can go and read uh, like uh, the whole page and it's full of useful information. Uh, however, just on a high level, we started with a digital marketplace which um, is able, is capable of handling only one listing or only one sale. <clears throat> And this cell is uh, written into the global storage of the contract. Well, actually, let me try to pull, pull that uh, code. Right, so as I was saying, this contract will be able to handle one single listing. Uh, that's because the contract essentially can, like, um, declares one global state slot to remember the asset ID and one for the unitary price. And whatever the balance of the account, um, I'm sorry, whatever the balance, the contract's balance for the asset will be, uh, well, that's the totality of the assets deposited by the seller. So we don't need another separate slot to remember the balance of the seller because that will just be the balance of the contract. So in this particular instance, we are not required to do any kind of accounting. And from a higher level, we know that we will do some accounting uh, in the upgrade of this digital marketplace because the, the new iteration, the upgraded version will be able to handle listings and sell orders for many different sellers, for many different assets. So already we know that all the assets are going to be uh, like the, the, the new contract will be the custodian for all the assets from all the users and uh, all the sell orders. So we will need some additional information. Um, so yeah, so I want to review the characteristics of global storage and box storage. So global storage can be at most 64 key values slots, which means that if the same application is going to handle um, is going to handle all the sell orders for all the users, then we, this means that we could at most theoretically serve 64 users, which is not what we want to do. Um, possibly a little more if we do something clever with the memory, but in general global storage size is capped, cannot be expanded arbitrarily. Okay, so we look to local storage to solve our problems and on paper this looks very promising because this is at most 16 key values uh, for each user. So the storage that the contract can use can scale with the number of users and a single users uh, it's likely that he, they will never need more than 16 slots to, to register information. Um, however, this local storage has a big problem and that we need to be aware of. The clear state is a particular um, invocation of the smart contract, which is used to, as the name suggests, clear the state of, clear the local state of a user. And this is a um, mechanism put in place because we don't want users to be stuck in a contract. So we can see here that um, the opted-in user address is responsible for funding local storage. 
So this means that for each user that uses local storage on a contract, uh, that user is going to have to allocate some um, algos. And if the logic for the contract does not allow the user to opt out, then they are stuck. So clear state is a mechanism put in place to prevent that. And because we want every user to always be able to reclaim and to store to reclaim algos and to potentially be able to delete the account if they want. If they are stuck, they cannot do that. Um, this is problematic because the user could unintentionally or maliciously um, try to issue calls, uh, clear state calls. And in that, that means that the contract needs to have mechanism or code that uh, kind of can mitigate the problems of um, clearing state. So without going too much into detail for local storage and clear state, we're not going to use it. So we turn to box storage. And box storage is kind of the best of both worlds because um, we can have actually uh, as many box as the contract needs when it needs them. So this is essentially storage, un uh, unlimited storage owned by the application itself. So not the creator of the contract, neither the user using the contract. Box boxes are owned by the contract, which means that it is the contract responsibility to allocate algos for their use. And this is um, this is the third, uh, yeah, the this third sub bullet point, um, and they the the logic for the contract decides when the boxes are created, modified, or destroyed. Um, so it, boxes are, are not for the user to clear. This is very this is very important because it means that boxes solve our problem and we you can imagine how we can have a single um, a box for each sale that we are having on the listing on the digital marketplace contract and this is precisely what we're going to do with the use of box map uh, box map we're going to see in detail in the code later but essentially you can give it a key um, and this object in TypeScript will um, pick pick up a box that contains the information for the user. Um, we're going to see this um, again in detail uh, in the code. So let's try to open uh, the project. Okay, I have opened the project in my uh, preferred IDE. And never mind the indexing, but let's um, take a look at the project structure. So in the latest versions of AlgoKit, what you will have is a workflow, I'm sorry, a work, uh, how was it called? A workspace, yeah, a, a workspace type project, which means that the root folder uh, will be kind of the house the house for the other sub projects. And so we can notice that we have a contracts project and a front end project. And today and tomorrow actually too, we are going to write the contract uh, that are here. And in the second session, we're going to write the tests for the contract. So I think without further ado, let's uh, go to the next recording where we start coding the contract. All right, so let's check out the contract that comes with a template. And as promised, it contains the initial example that you can play with. <clears throat> um, so one other thing that you can do manually, which we won't be actually we won't be needing to do that very often manually, but it's good to have uh, this information in mind is that if you take a look at the package.json file, 
you will see that it com the template comes with some uh, useful utilities for your code. So what we will be using often actually is npm run fix. And this essentially, oh, sorry, I'm not in the folder for the contracts. And this will essentially do a lint fix of your code. Now, um, it comes with two errors actually, <laughs> but the reason why these errors are here is because um, to every contract, there is an associated art compilation artifact. And we can generate those compilation artifacts with npm run compile contract. And this will generate here the uh, bytecode for the, or rather the DL code for the contract. And it will also generate some interface for this contract. So this is information about what the contract can do. And in, for instance, in this case, we know that this, this contract has a method called do math that takes two numbers and a string and returns a number. Okay, so from these artifacts, we can generate clients for this contract. So npm run generate client. There you go. This is going to generate this client here, which we will be using. We had we have used uh, the client in the beginner bootcamp, and we were going to do the same for the intermediate one. But one, uh, once you generate the client for the first time, uh, then you will notice that if you run again npm run fix, uh, there are no more errors because the previously wrong <coughs> import errors are now resolved because the client is actually created. So in this contract right here, um, Let's start by removing the code that we know we won't need. And I'm just going to keep a small, small terminal. And so we mentioned the box map. We So let's start with storage. So we said that for each, we, we will want to have multiple sales in the same contract. So now we must think, okay, what makes a cell unique? Like what information can I use to reference a particular cell? And I think that the seller address and the asset ID are the first that come to mind. Um, and this is because of course, uh, two sales are different if they are sold by someone, by two different distinct people. Uh, and if uh, it's the same person with the same address selling different assets. Okay, so let's start writing this down. So we are going to declare a type called uh, for sale ID. And this type is an object of type owner, which, which is for the seller, um, and an asset, which is an asset ID. And also, oh, this, this should be actually semicolons. And, in, oh, right, uh, I was <laughs> getting ahead of myself. So, if this is the only information that we require for two sales to be distinct, uh, well, then we have a problem because the same owner for the same asset, maybe they would like to put up a sale for different prices. So for instance, let's suppose that they want to sell 10 units of an ASA. Uh, however, they, do, they want to sell two units at a price of 1.5 algos and they want to sell eight units at the price of 
to algos and they may want to do that because they want to sell something a portion of their uh, assets quickly uh, while another portion can go for sale at a higher price and that's not a problem so what i actually want to define for the key of a sale is actually a nonce this will be a number that can change a numerical a numerical information that can change for the same owner and add an asset so if we suppose the example we just mentioned uh, the, the the order for at a, at a lowest price can be can have nonce zero and the order for eight units at a higher price can have nonce of one and therefore we can make the two orders distinct and have them have different prices so for the information that this um, cell cell is composed by com composed of we want to remember the deposited amount of assets into this contract and the unitary price so again now the contract is going to be the custodian for all the assets of all the users and all the uh, possible types of ASAs so we need to do some accounting um, because you can easily imagine how if we don't do the accounting uh, one user could empty the contract and essentially steal the assets from all other users that are using the same application as them so yeah we, we just want to remember how much we deposit in, into the contract and um, the way that we create a box map into a TypeScript contract is now I call this listings and this is equal to a box map of type uh, now this is this takes like the uh, key type and the value type and the key type is the for sale ID and the value type is the for sale info uh, you can optionally pass something to this I believe uh, I just did a control dot click on, a, on it and the options are dynamic size prefix and allow potential collisions uh, this is pretty advanced stuff we are not going to need this uh, I just did a control dot click on it, on it and the options are dynamic size prefix and allow potential collisions um, this is pretty advanced stuff we are not going to need this um, just bear in mind that you can uh, specify some options for the box mapping and now we need to talk about oh wait ah yeah let's do something before we talk about some theoretical information the other common that a oh, compile contract there you go so we, we want to make sure that we try to compile the contract frequently so that we don't uh, you know end up with errors uh, that happened way in the past and we don't we didn't notice so if we try to compile the contract frequently we will notice as soon as they happen um, we want to talk about some information and so for that let's go back to the page um, the Algorand developer uh, portal and now we want to look for the cost associated with a box because uh, as, as we read again um, the app account the smart contract is responsible for funding the box storage and the way that we are going to do this is that uh, we are going to require each user that wants to put up a listing to provide to the contract this um, algos we're going to do the proper accounting for them too and we're going to allow the user to recover those algos when they delete the listing uh, but first we need to figure out how much it costs for uh, a box and let me try to 
uh, find that information for you and we'll review it together. Yeah, so all that you need to do is look for algorithm parameters table uh, that's in the get details section and algorithm parameters table. So we want to look for minimum balance for a smart contract. So this is the information at the bottom of this table that we need to compute how much algos we need for a box uh, that's made up of, uh, you know, this is, these, are, these are the information that we require from a box. So let's just notice that each box requires 0 0.0025 algos. And I'm going to take a note of that um, quickly. And you can you cannot see this at the moment because I'm switching between uh, windows. But and then per byte in box created, this is the amount of algos. And we need to include the length of the key uh, to calculate the. Uh, the increase in minimum balance requirements. Okay, let's switch to the code. So, uh, so now, we, so we know that we have a type from key to value, and this is equal. Sorry, this is equal to an address. A, an asset ID, which I suspect it is, is a number, essentially. Yeah, the ID is just a number. So uh, a number, an, a, an, an, an unsigned integer of 64 bits uh, is 8 bytes long. So And then another one for the nonce. And this maps to two numbers. Uh, again, what this is equal to is 32 bytes, because an address is 32 bytes long, plus 8 bytes, plus 8 bytes, mapping to an 8 plus 8 bytes, which again, this is equal to 16 uh, plus 32, this is um, 48, mapping to a 16. So we know that we want to uh, add also the length of the key, so this is equal to uh, 64 bytes. Uh, taking this formula, we know that uh, so if this is this is expressed in algos, so this is in micro algos is 2,500 micro algos, uh, and this is per box plus this amount of micro algos so this would be uh, we have to remove three decimals for uh, we need to remove six so this is 400 times 64 bytes and this is equal to uh, not to make this calculation uh, with a calculator this is equal to 28,100 micro algos, which is again equal to 0, 0, uh, 0.028 and 1, if I'm not mistaken. So, I think we want to have this information here, and oh, so this is algo micro algo and 
and we want to then put this in a constant so that we can use it in our contract. Um, I think, let me review something and we'll start with the next recording. Uh, so before we start with the next recording, I thought I'd answer uh, Paul's question. So yes, the, it, you are exactly correct. The MBR is a refundable deposit. And we are going to talk more about this in the next recording. Uh, but the way that you should think about it is that whenever you are using the blockchain to store data, um, this data is kind of stored <clears throat> on everybody's computer, right? Because then uh, these participants of the network reach a consensus, each based on their own uh, ledger. And they keep making progress by adding blocks to the ledger. But in principle, any data that is occupying the blockchain state must be rented. It's space that must be rented in some sense. So this is exactly what it is. As long as you are using the data, you have to have at least this balance. And as you scale back your application or um, I mean, as you scale back the amount of data that your application uses, this um, requirement will be lowered progressively. Um, and, and ideally, you start with an empty account, and as you use the data, your balance, your minimum balance increases. But as you delete the data, you should be able to um, delete the account at some point. Because if you delete all the data, you should be able to recover all the MBR. In the case of a contract, it's usually the case that we want the user to pay for the data of the contract. Uh, because the, in, in the case of boxes, uh, the data will be owned by the contract. So I hope this answers your question. And let's go forward with the next recording. Right. So in this recording, we want to cover um, having this contract, opting into the assets that people are going to create listings for. So what this means is that the address for this contract, the I mean, the address that this contract is given at creation time, in general, just like any other contract, we need to opt in the asset that uh, it needs to handle and this will, this is exactly the same as we did for the beginner uh, only in the beginner case we didn't um, we only did it once for the single asset that we are handling and now we want to have a method that's general enough that anyone can pay for the contract to obtain an asset uh, and in order for them to create listings and to deposit these assets into the contract. So this method looks like this. We want to define a public um, method on this class, which we call allow asset. And this will have an MBR pay because remember, the contract is going to be allocating algos from his algo balance to obtain this new asset. So we ask the user to provide these algos for the contract. And the other arguments that we need is the we need to know which asset we want to opt into. Um, one caveat with this method is that we um let's let's just write it and then we'll talk about it so we want to verify a payment transaction which in this case is the mbr pay 
that uh, we are the receiver of this contract so this dot app dot address and the amount is globals so globals is an object that will tell us that will tell us about information in the network so it is the case for testnet and bearnet and mainnet that the network uh, decides and, it, and this is constant like f since the beginning since the first block is it has always been like this constant value of 0 0.1 algos but the cool thing is that we don't need to to um, inline or hard code this value in the contract we can have we can ask the network itself using this opcode what is the minimum balance for that asset and this makes the contract just a bit more um, you know resilient uh, future proof yeah let's say for future proof okay once we have verified that this contract receives the funds we want to do the opt-in actually so send an asset transfer uh, which is made out of so let's select the asset first and this will be just the asset that's in the arguments here and the asset amount the way that we do an opt-in is that we specify an asset amount equal to zero and the receiver is still is the app address itself so in general an asset opt-in looks like a a zero asset transfer from a to a uh, and this will allow the contract to opt-in now the one caveat with this uh, code is that uh, imagine that you, some user called this method more than once for the same asset uh, there is nothing in this code that will prevent them to do so uh, but it doesn't make sense because once we are opted in unless we have some logic later to opt out which we want uh, we want to make sure actually that this code is only ever called once for the same asset uh, so we need to check that this application address is not opted in to the asset that's it with this we prevent people from calling this method more than once for the same asset because we are going to detect if we already did the opt-in um, so one mm, again another caveat with this is that this cost is unrecoverable so this cost is essentially paid f for by the user uh, the first user that wants to create a listing for a specific asset, right? But then once the application and the contract is opted into that asset, more people can come in and create listings for that asset. So it's, what this means essentially is that um, it's not guaranteed that the user will be able to close and recover this payment uh, whenever they want because there may be other listings made from other users and imagine if you have to refund a thousand users in the network that's not it that, that cannot fit a thousand transactions do not fit a single application call because an application call can only make 256 inner transactions so just imagine the chaos that would um, uh, that would take place if someone tried to disallow an asset and recover this MBR pay if there were multiple listings for that asset so this is we are going to consider this essentially as an unrecoverable cost and it's going to be in the contract forever but it's not a lot of money it's um, 1.0.1 um, algos so I think that's fine and um so ju just to clear this point up that we just saw um because we also talked about this mbr being a recoverable cost so it, it is in principle it is recoverable uh, however when this mbr is owned by a contract there needs to be code 
in the contract to send that recovered cost out of the contract itself and back to the creator or back to the user or back to whoever paid it. What I'm saying in, in, in this method is that the cost, why it is in theory recoverable, in this specific example and in this specific application, we are not going to recover it um, because the first user allows that asset for every other user in the network. And um, therefore, it is unlikely that all the other users will ever close all the listing for a specific asset. And what I mean by the cost being cheap is that the asset is allowed globally. So it is allowed for the entire application. So uh, I, I, again, every other user will benefit from this asset being already allowed. This means that the cost does not scale with the number of users, but it scales with the number of distinct assets that are handled by the application. So this is what I mean by the cost is not that high. Um, so yeah, I hope this uh, puts these uh, comments into context. Let's continue with the recording. And then the deposit. Now, what we would like to do is essentially do this. This will be an asset transfer transaction, right? And this will be the deposit of asset into the contract. So an, 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 um, an asset transfer, transfer transaction associated with the method call. Oh, we need to give it, give this a name, deposit. And then um, we want to register this into a box, right? So when we said that a box is identified by the owner, the asset ID, and the nonce. Now, in this case, the owner is going to be the person calling this deposit method and also transferring the assets. We are going to make sure that they are the same sender. Uh, but we want to know about the nonce, right? Because they are the user is going to tell us which of the pos all the possible nonces for the asset and the user they would like to write this information to. And a unitary price. Um, yes, because if this is the first deposit, we want to set a price for the assets. Uh, there is a problem with this. And the problem is that we said that a box costs you money, right? And the problem is that we said that a box costs you money, right? So, but only the first deposit will cost the user money because it, it, that's the point where they need to create the box. So we need to actually add a payment to this contract, which we will verify, uh, and we will call this first deposit. And whatever we write here, we know that we are going to also have a deposit method, which is exact, well, kind of the same as this, only the difference is, since we don't need a payment to pay for the box, uh, we can uh, eliminate that from the deposit method and we don't we don't I, in general I don't think that we want to set a new unitary price each time we make a new deposit I think that once we set it the first time we want to be able to do that separately from a deposit and we're going to be able to we're going to write a method to do just that but this is in general the structure of the two uh, deposits method one thing to know is that there is no um, kind of overloading of a method name uh, and so we couldn't have these two methods call, be called the same and have uh, different signatures for their arguments. So 
um, this is for reason that are uh, be beyond the scope of this session but just know that we have to split this method into two methods because one of them has a an, a pay and a, um, an additional argument okay so the first deposit so we should make sure that um, the box that we want to create does not already exist how, how do we do that is we uh, say we negate the value of this listings and listings so let's check listings out for a second and it, it, this thing is a box map and a box map will um, return you a function from key type to uh, value type so what this means is that we call this listings and this we call it, we call it as a function and here we have to write the key so the key will be the owner which as we said is this uh, is the set is the color of the method so each each user that calls this method is only going to be able to access their own boxes and not anyone else's boxes the asset is the is the asset involved in the asset transfer transaction and the nonce is just going to be the nonce passed as a an argument and so we want to check if this box it does not exist let's uh, verify that uh, this payment is coming from the same oh, the same sender color of the method and it and it goes to the address for this contract and the amount is exactly what we computed here so it is the for sale MBR this is the cost for the contract to create the box okay we want to also verify that the asset transfer is coming from the sender the asset receiver is again the address for this application and the asset amount now we want to we want to use a different syntax and we want to check that this is not an empty deposit there's there wouldn't necessarily be anything wrong with the with a with an empty deposit as long as you know it doesn't break anything else but in this case it would be fine but we still want to disallow it um, just because it doesn't really make sense to make an empty deposit, right? Uh, it doesn't change anything else, so I don't see why people would make a first deposit, a first empty deposit. So in order for us to, you know, handle not too many edge cases, let's just disallow empty deposits. Okay, so now all that it remains for us to do is that we want to save this the accounting for the deposit and the unitary price in a box so that we can uh, process that information later so this will be this listings and we're going to access it in the same way as we did before this is this is the key and um, okay a couple of things about the box map which uh, we're going to see a lot of so better to explain them um, sooner now unfortunately what we would really like to do is this right because we want we don't want to repeat ourselves over and over we would like to do this uh, and also this right 
Um, Uh, but unfortunately, uh, types, uh, TypeScript does not support this syntax. So that's why, uh, because it, it does not support assignment of arbitrary objects. So what you will see me do a lot of is um, hard coding the key into the uh, box map. And in this case, we call exists because we we write the key and we ask if it exists. Um, now we want to actually assign a value to this box, right? And so what we want to do is we want to reference its value, the value of the box, and assign it an object that is of the form deposited and unitary price because this is the for sale info. So this is going to be deposited and this, this is the first deposit we are creating the box right now. So the initial deposit will just be whatever is deposited by this uh, asset transfer. And the unitary price, again, this is the first deposit. So it will just be the unitary price specified by the user at the time of calling this method. And this is everything that we need from the first deposit method. Uh, now, the, the, the actual deposit is kind of similar, but it requires um, some different code. So I'm going to copy this assert, and we want to actually uh, not negate it, but assert that this box already exists. Uh, because at this time, th this deposit is supposed to be following a first deposit because the box is supposed to already exist because we don't take a payment into this method and therefore the box must already be paid for. So we want to assert that the box exists um, and we want to verif still verify the asset transfer. And we want to make sure that the, set, the, the the person that deposits the asset is the same as the one that is calling the contract method. We want to make sure that the receiver is the address for this application. And the, again, the, the asset amount is not non-negative. Okay, great. So now we actually already have a box, which in general is going to have a deposited amount and a, um, a unitary price. So now we are going to essentially replace the information in that box because we are going to overwrite the content. So we have to save the current content of the box. You will see why. We just need to deposit to the current deposited whatever is the new uh, amount that's coming in. So the current deposited is this dot listings with I'm just going to copy the key. And so dot value dot deposited. Now this line, I, I realize that is uh, a bit too long. So let's run the utility. And okay, and you can see that we have saved into a variable the deposited field of the box content. And we actually want to do the same for the unitary price. Okay, now, th now that we have saved the current state of the box, let's overwrite the content. Uh, again, same key. And the assignment we do with dot value and then equal to a new box content, which is deposited 
the new deposited field will be the current deposited plus whatever amount it is deposited uh, by the user. And the unitary price stays the same, so we this is just the current unitary price. Uh, I think uh, instead of stopping the recording here, let's just write a fast method, which was literally, literally two lines. And we want to have a method to set the price of a listing. Because again, otherwise you would only be able to set your price at the first deposit. And we said that we want to have a way to do that even after the uh, the deposit and we, since we we didn't even do this here now we need a method to do it and so again a sale is identified by the seller which the owner which is going to be the person calling this contract an asset and a nonce now of course we want to take also the new unitary price and again, this method will be very fast because this time, now that we are overwriting again the value of the co the content of the box, we just need to remember the current deposited. And this is this listings. I just uh, pasted the previous key. Uh, now, th at this point, we are not. We don't have a, a deposit coming in, but we have an asset as an argument. So the user is going to specify which asset they want and we asset and nonce they want to uh, update the price. Um, so, okay, so this is dot value. And we don't need to save the current unitary price because we, we are just going to overwrite it in the next uh, line. So is this listings, again, the same key, dot value. This is a, will be an assignment and the deposited, it stays the same. So it's the current deposited and the unitary price becomes the new unitary price. Um, let's see, maybe I'm hitting some uh, type, a type issue. Ah, I see. I should have, I should have said dot value dot deposited. Yeah. Okay. So this is now the current, the only the deposited value. Right. Yeah, this is it. Um, so this is the method to change the price. And in the next uh, recording, we're going to write the other two methods of this contract, which are going to be uh, withdraw and buy, so that the user can also, uh, you know, be refunded and close a sale and some other user can come and buy the deposited assets. So I'll see you in the next recording. Okay, I see no questions. So I think we're going to go forward with the next recording. Ah, that's not right. <laughs> so this, re no, this is definitely not the next recording. Hold on. Welcome back. This is the last recording for today's session. Um, and we are going to write the withdraw and buy methods. So I think let's kind of write them uh, in the other, the opposite order, uh, because I, I think that the, writing the buy uh, it kind of makes sense when you write your methods in terms of 
the life cycle of the contract. Like the, the withdraw is kind of the last set step that happens for a single listing. So I think it makes sense to write it last. So we have a public method called buy. And okay, so we, we I'll write some stuff and then we'll talk about it while I, I'm writing it. Let's stop here for, for, for a moment. Um, and okay, let's consider some things. Uh, there, is a, there is a conceptual um, you know, property of the assets that we need to consider. And for that, I think let's go to actually to the documentation page in the, on the Algorand developer portal. And let's click on Algorand standard assets. Um, no, this is not what we want to do, actually. Um, algorithm parameters table, maybe. Let's look for transaction reference. Yes, this is the page that we want. So transaction reference. Now, I want to go into the page that... Um, asset configuration transaction. So when we create an ASA on an Algorand network, we issue an asset configuration transaction. And we there is a field that we need to review. Uh, so this configuration can either be, um, that, that it, it can be multiple things, but um, we want to look at except like this asset params field of the transaction. So there are a couple of properties of assets when we create them. So the total, see this will be the supply of the asset. And um, I don't know, for example, the unit name, this is on the asset name, the URL, this is some metadata, optional metadata associated with an asset. But there are two fields that are actually well, there are three fields that are required on creation. Uh, decimals, we'll talk about last. Total, we just talked about. And default frozen. Uh, this uh, refers to another property of ASAs, which is that they can be froze by the freeze address. So any ASA can specify an address that is capable of freezing assets um, most not most but a lot of assets will have this default frozen set to false um, so which means that any account that owns this asset is able to uh, send it and exchange it at any moment in time from the creation and mo a lot of these assets also have the freeze address empty so if the freeze asset is empty then there is no address that can freeze these uh, asas um just uh this was just um, um this is not actually the focus of our discussion but it's good to know this property about the asset what we actually want to talk about is decimals. So if you know um, some assets, let me switch to, so hold on, let's read what this says first. The number of digits to use after the decimal point when displaying the asset. If zero, the asset is not divisible. If one, the base unit of the asset is in tenths. If two, the base unit of the asset is in the hundreds, if three, the base unit of the asset is in the thousands. And so on up until up to 19 decimal places. So let's switch to the code view. What this is actually saying is that, so let's just make some comment at the bottom of this file. We'll, we'll delete them, but um, let's say that I create an asset with 
decimals equal to 3. Okay. What this means is that my, uh, my ASA can be expressed in terms of um, units. So I can have like, like whole numbers. So I don't know, 1, 2, 3, uh, 4, 5, 6. But then I can also have a dot 789. And this is at most 3 decimals in base 10. So this number, when it is expressed in base 10, we will need to actually, uh, so if we, let's, uh, let's review some code that we wrote. Yes, so we, we accept a, an asset transfer as an argument of the deposit, right? And this asset transfer is a transaction that specifies an asset amount. So this asset amount will be a whole number. Uh, however, depending on the number of decimals specified by the asset, we will need to keep in mind that this uh, whole number, which in this case it will be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. This is the whole number that we expect. as a field of the transaction. However, this whole number, we need to keep in mind that if the decimals are equal to three, then this whole number must be scaled down by three decimal places, okay? So this is actually the amount of the asset that we are depositing. Uh, we are saying all of this because at, in a moment we are going to have to calculate the price of a single unit of, a, of the ASA. This is why any time that we update the price, we call it the unitary price. So this is the price in ALGO for one unit of the asset. But where this whole unit is depends on the amount of decimals of the asset. So if we have a deposit that is uh, this number right here, we need to remember that um, the price is for one unit, so at this decimal place. Um, this is going to come into play in a second. So, with this in mind, these are the essential information to identify a cell. Now, why do we need to include the owner in this um, buy method? Uh, because in general, the by method will be, will be called by a third party account. So we will need to also specify wh who is the seller um, because it, it won't be the, the buyer itself, right? We, the seller is a third party account. So the other arguments that I was going to write in this uh, method are the buy pay. And this is actually the transaction that the, buy, the buyer will um, pass as an argument to this method call and um, this is the payment to the seller. And we're going to specify a quantity. So the buyer will tell the contract how many units of that asset they want to buy. And this quantity will also need to be expressed by the buyer with the uh, correct amount of decimals, depending on which asset they are buying. So if they want to buy, so this is, let's say that this is the current deposited, right? Um, the quantity. Uh, let's say that I want to buy a unit and a half. This would be 1.5. Uh, however, expressed as a whole number with three decimals, this will actually be 1,500. Because we know that in reality, we need to rescale this number. Okay. So, Let's write uh, what we need to do. So 
in order for us to make a sale, we will need to verify that the seller is getting paid by this uh, additional transaction and that we send the quantity that the buyer wants to buy uh, of assets to the buyer. And of course, the quantity uh, will be related to um, the payment transaction by the unitary price. So we want to make sure first that we uh, read the content of the box. So um, let's do a current deposited. This is equal to listings. And the key is the owner is the, the owner passed by the buyer. The asset is the asset and the nonce is you know like I'm saying the asset is the asset passed as an argument the nonce is the nonce passed as an argument. Okay. So this is dot value dot deposited. We can essentially copy this line and extract the unitary price. Perfect. Okay, now we need to figure out for this uh, quantity and this price, how much the buy pay has to be. The amount of the buy pay has to be. So the amount to be paid will be equal to a wide ratio. We'll, we'll get into how this function works in just a second. Now you can see actually that um, we are accessing the decimals property of the asset passed as an argument. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this function uh, and why, like, uh, what, does, what is this doing? Okay, so we have, let's review, we have a quantity that is a whole number which we need to rescale back of uh, 10 to the number of as decimal assets because like moving the moving the decimal point equals to dividing or multiplying by 10 to the uh, some number and this is the scientific notation for uh, representing a number and we have a unitary price which is expressed as a whole number of micro algos. So if we want to know the, um, the amount to be paid in micro algos, we need to multiply the whole number um, expressed in micro algos of the price times the quantity. However, Let's also review this like, uh, briefly. Let's say that I have a, a, a unitary price of 1.5 algos. The whole number in micro algos representing 1.5 algos is this. And if I multiply that by, let's say that I want to buy two units 0.7 of an asset. And let's say that this asset has decimals equal to three, then 2.7 is expressed as 2,700. What happens if I perform this multiplication as it is? Um, just get my calculator. And this is the result. Oh, uh, yeah. So let's just group the digits. OK. so. This in micro algos is equal to, uh, well, let's divide by 10 to the 6. 
this is 4,000. This is way too much, right? We don't expect to buy two units, two units 0.7 of something that each cost 1.5 algos and we pay 4,000 algos. No, no, no. The important thing to understand here is that when you multiply two whole numbers that each have an implicit scaling factor and all of the, this field that I'm kind of summarizing here is called fixed point arithmetic and I encourage you to read more about it because as as we write smart contracts we often handle prices and it's really really important that prices are handled carefully um, so I, enco I really encourage you to read more about this field of uh, math. However, the short version is that when we multiply two whole numbers that each have an implicit scale factor, this, this scale factor is one, uh, 10 to the 6th uh, because this is expressed in microalgos and this is 10 to the 3rd because this is expressed, well, I mean we can see that the decimals are equal to 3. Right, so if we want to scale back this number to just microalgos, we need to remove the amount of decimals that come from the asset. So we actually need to remove three digits. And if we do that, let's just do it uh, just for the demonstration. Then we scale this to algos, right? So this is in micro algos, algos, and this is equal to 4.05 uh, algo. And this is the correct result, right? Because this is equal to uh, 1.5 algos times 2.7 units of asset. I'm confirming that this is <laughs> this is right. I know that it is right, but uh, you know, better to double check. So 1.5 times 2.7, 4.05. Perfect. Okay. So this is essentially the math that we are doing. So you can see that we are multiplying in the numerator factors the two numbers, and then we are dividing them by 10 to the asset decimals. And so it means that we are scaling this number back. Um, and this is what it means. Now, why is this in a wide ratio function? Because technically, this is a 64-bit number, and this is a 64-bit number. If you multiply them together, in general, they can overflow. And this function essentially ta takes care of uh, the case where they overflow and... Um, it just um, carries on this kind of computation safely, uh, allowing this overflow, which will be then rescaled back. Um, yes, so another thing that is important to understand is that we are just saying 10 to the asset decimals. Now, is this number small enough to fit in a 64-bit single number? This is an important question because as this, we need to know how big this number can be because 10 to the something in general can be a pretty big number. Now, we said from the documentation that the, the number of decimal digits can be up to 19 decimal places. Okay, so let me just... Um, pause the recording and I'll give you like the answer to this. Okay, so this is the answer to our question. 2 to the 64 is in general, well, this is actually not true. Um, sorry about that. This is 10 to the 64 minus 1. 10 to the 64 minus 1 is in general the largest number that you can represent using 64 bits. And the result tells us that it is always possible so to represent 10 to the 19 which is the largest number that we can have as a scaling factor so we are fine if this was big even bigger there are ways to get around that but in this case we have calculated that 
uh, in general, even the worst case, we can still, it's still smaller than the largest representable number in 64 bits. Okay, with this out of the way, we have now the correct amount that the user needs to pay for that asset. And therefore, there, is, there are a couple of things that we want to do. So verify, we want to, we want to verify that this transaction is coming from the caller of the method. Uh, and the receiver is not going to be the contract this time, it's going to be the owner, because we want the algos to go straight to the owner. Because in general, there is no problem with sending algos to an address. It's not like an, 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 an ASA where they have to opt in the asset. It's always safe to send um, algos. If we accepted payments in other ASAs, then we may want to redirect this payment to the contract that will act as a custodian until the owner um, withdraws the profits. But in general, algos, there's no problem with it. The amount needs to be what we just computed it to be, so the amount to be paid. Um, and then we actually want to pay out the buyer. So send an asset transfer. The asset is going to be the asset specified in the arguments. The receiver is going to be the buyer. So in this case is the caller of this method. And the amount is going to be the quantity as specified by the, uh, by the buyer. We have verified that they have paid exactly what they need to pay for. As a last, as a last thing, um, we want to update the content of the box. So this box, let me copy the key. This box.value is going to be equal to deposited. Well, this will be the previous value of the deposited minus the quantity. And the unitary price is going to be the same because buying something doesn't change the price of that listing. Now, I want to bring your attention to something. So far, we haven't considered that if the deposit amount was higher or larger than the quantity of assets requested. This is fine because we, even though we have carried with everything, at this line, we are trying to subtract the quantity from the deposited amount. And if this operation results in an underflow, which is to say the quantity is larger than the current deposit, uh, this contract, uh, this method call will fail. And all of the progress that we have made will not be recorded by the ledger. So this is fine as long as we keep this operation here, because if this fails, this is a transaction, so it means that um, everything that is, it is, a, it is an indivisible unit of work. So if this fails, everything else fails as well. Um, so this is why we haven't checked, because we are just, you know, um, subtracting. And if this fails, then everything else is also uh, not saved as a state of the chain. So this is fine for us to do. I think, uh, yeah, let's just go ahead with the last method, which should be quicker than this one, uh, because we won't need to do as much arithmetic in this one. So it is a public uh, withdraw. We're going to need to know the asset and the nonce. So we need to know how much it is currently deposited, in this case the owner will be the sender of this transaction, the 
deposited. In this case, the owner will be the sender of this transaction. And the again, the asset will just be the argument asset and the nonce, the argument nonce dot value dot deposited. Okay. Ah, we forgot the space here. Um, so this withdraw method will work such that the user will recover all the unsold assets and it will also recover the for sale box MBR which they provided during the first deposit. So this is the this is a recoverable cost for them. So we will need to send a payment and this goes from uh, well the contract which is the default so to the receiver which is the transaction sender and the amount will be the close uh, the MBR for sale MBR and send asset transfer this is just to uh, close the listing and send them back every unsold asset that they may still have oh I'm sorry uh, the current deposit so how much is left this is what we're sending back okay if we try to execute this it will fail and uh, well hold on if we try to do this it will fail so this listings copy the key and then do a delete this will fail the reason is that in general there could be just enough algos in the contract to hold all the boxes involved in listings so what do you think happens if we try to send the payment before deleting the box it may happen and it, it's it's likely that this will happen that this contract will fail at the moment of sending a payment because these algos are still needed to hold the box so we want to actually move this line of code before the payment and this is because this is why we also save the current deposited before deleting the box uh, because of course once we delete the box the information is not available to the rest of the, the like to the sequence of instruction that follow the deletion of the block the box so we save it we delete it send it back the amount for sale the sorry the mbr for the box and then we send back all the assets that may be uh, left unsold and i think with this we are good to go and we are going to tackle oh, let me try to delete this we are going to tackle testing of this contract uh, in tomorrow's session because we want to make sure that uh, what we wrote is solid and it works uh, kind of as, it, as we expect so we want to have at least some testing to convince ourselves that this contract does actually what we want and it can do so in a reliable manner so um, with that let me stop this recording Wonderful. So, thanks, Georgia, for this interesting session one. I see one question, but first of all, today we learned how to add more functionalities to our digital marketplace, and in that way, we can have a contract that make look more like a DAB that we can deploy on mainnet. The most important thing is to watch the recording, try to understand. Let's see if it comes back on a smart contract so those are the things and 
be able to implement boxes is something pretty useful and you need to understand the MBR, the way that you can record information on the boxes. And over here, we learn how to do it. So, George, what are the other scenarios for using boxes? What are the recommendations that you can give to us? Uh, so, other scenarios for using boxes it would be for sure if you have like a, a data structure that has no bounds. So imagine a list of elements. This list, you may need to have an unlimited number of elements. Um, so this may be a very good use case. Um, and also like anything in general that you don't know the size ahead of time. That would be a good use case for boxes. Uh, and maybe we won't we will not see the how to mitigate the problems from clear state, but um, if you want to avoid that problem also together, yeah, boxes are really fit for that purpose. Wonderful. Paul asked or mentioned, how the Nalgora smart contract in TypeScript seems in principle to be similar to Algo. How do you decide on which of these two languages you will use? is purely based on which language you are more used to or there are other considerations? Yeah, so, you know, both languages, uh, I don't want to say at this moment that um, I don't remember exactly um, what release stage both languages are, but I will say that they are at, in a good place uh, at the moment and we recommend using both. I would say that it is a matter of preference because you can see how Algokit is a pretty modular framework in that the contracts can be of the language that you prefer. And let's say that you decide to write your contracts in TypeScript, your client can be generated in Python. So you can have a Python backend with a TypeScript frontend and a TypeScript client. And you can have any you know, mix of those. So I would say, that Algokit made this um, job pretty modular and it's ultimately a matter of preference and a matter of your application. I would say try it and if you hit some roadblocks, you can also try the, uh, the, uh, the Python version or the type tier TypeScript version. And uh, I would say it also allows you, if you have a team, uh, it allows each person in the team to be comfortable in their own language and you can still collaborate together easily, I would say. So these are the things to keep in consideration. 100% and for example, in my case, I prefer Python. But if you want to create a beautiful user interface, you need to use TypeScript and React. So in that way, you can mix the best of two worlds. But yeah. Okay, the time passed very quick, but we learned a lot. I don't know if there is another question. Hold on a second. Let me take a look. You will receive the re recording once the session ends. And yeah, those are the things. I don't know, George, do you have an, any additional comment before we end today's session? No, I'm all good. Okay, wonderful. So thanks everyone for joining us and looking forward to seeing you in tomorrow's session.